All right. Good morning, Grace. How's everybody doing? You guys doing good? Good. I'm doing well myself. Hey, my name is Dan. If we have not had a chance to meet yet, I'm the campus pastor here, and I will be out in the lobby. Love to, to connect with you. We'll be hanging out here for, uh, for Sunday fun day as well. I'm going to get the waffles. I feel like that sounds good. Uh, and I'm kind of weird. I'm kind of weird about the, uh, what's that sauce? The tzatziki sauce? Is that what it's called? Is that what that stuff is? It comes with Mediterranean food or Greek food. I don't really like it. But I'm going to get something anyway. So, uh, hey, I resonate a lot with what Brindy just said. Uh, I, I had a crazy morning. Um, I just I woke up tired, woke up exhausted. Um, I got three kids. Nobody wanted to sleep good last night. And, man, am I feeling it today. But, hey, if it is your first or second time here with us, I do want to say welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, we're very stoked to have you. If you are watching online, whether it's live or whether it's later on Facebook, uh, we're happy to have you with us as well. Uh, feel free to, to share a comment or share the video. Um, I, I truly believe that when we write these messages, God has a word for somebody, whether you're in here with us this morning or whether you're watching online. So I would encourage you to do that. Hey, today we are starting a new series, okay, called Against the Odds. Against the Odds. We're going to be talking about relationships. We're going to be talking about marriage, things like that. Today, specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, singleness and biblical attraction. Now, if you are married, do not check out, okay? You're like, hey, singleness, did it, done it, been married for 15 years. Next, we are a phone-friendly church, but please don't pull out your phone, start scrolling through your Facebook. Pay attention because the principles that we are going to be going through this morning apply to each and every one of us. Uh, this morning, we're going to be spending some time in 1 Corinthians and the book of uh, Song of Solomon. Uh, so if you do have a Bible with you, great. The, some of the, the verses will be up on the screen. But if you don't have a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. We've got some ushers that will get a Bible to you. So before we jump in, uh, and as they're passing those out, let's go ahead and pray, shall we? Father God, we love you so much. We're so thankful, Lord, for, for all that you are, for all that you did last weekend, God, during Easter and all the lives that were changed, the people that were baptized, Lord. We, we don't want to forget that, Lord. And I pray today that you would just open our hearts to hear, God, what it is that you would have for us, God, whether we're single, whether we are married, whether we're somewhere in between. Father, I pray that your word would speak to us today, that it would be your, your words, not mine, Father. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, I've been married for almost 13 years, okay? I've got three kids, and my wife and I, we met at one of the ro most romantic places that you could meet somebody. We met in Walmart. <laughs> it's not a lie. It's 100% true. I was there with a friend, and my wife was there with another guy. We were in the school supply aisle because we were in college, right? I needed to pick up some pens. She needed something. I don't know, maybe a new boyfriend. I don't know. I don't know. She needed something. So we met in Walmart, and we started hanging out. We became really good friends right away. We started spending a lot of time together, started studying together, doing that whole thing. And we went to Bible college, and, and it was a lot of fun just getting to know her. Well, when I first met her, she had decided that she was going to take a, a year, a year's chunk of time and not date, not be in any sort of relationship. Well, I caught her kind of on the tail end of that one year that she had committed. And her year had ended, her year commitment of not dating was ending on uh, December 31st, 2003, okay? So I'd hung out with her this whole fall semester, right, of 2003. And when Christmas break came, I was back here in San Diego. She was, she was back at home, and I called her on January 1st. And I'm like, hey, so um, I know like your year is over. When we get back to school, I'd like to take you out on a date. And she didn't know what to do, right? I'm, I seem desperate at this point because I'm all the way across the country from her, and I'm calling her on the phone the very next day. Hey, so like, how was, how was Christmas? How was Thanksgiving? How was everything? Like, great, great. Do you want a date now? Right? So we get back to school. She kind of tells me, she's like, you know, like, let me think about it. I'm like, okay. We get back to college, and we're still hanging out, and she doesn't say anything about it, Right? Well, like a month and a half, almost two months go by, and she's just ignoring the fact that I asked her out on this date. And, and one night, we're driving back. I remember she was driving, and we're driving back to our college from this coffee shop that we were studying at. And I remember her saying, hey, so do you remember that you asked me out on a date 
a couple months ago. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I remember literally all I've been thinking about. <laughs> and she's like, so like, so tell me, like, how do you feel about me? And I was like, this is my chance. I'm going to roll the dice, right? I'm like, well, I, I really, I like you a lot. I see um, that you and I could have a future together. We have a lot of the same values. Everything that I would look for in a future wife you have. And she's like, right on. She's like, right on. I, I don't feel the same way. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm over like, me neither. <laughs> I don't either. That's good. You're being punked. Ashton's in the back seat. Like couple weeks later, we're out studying, and she just reaches across the table, grabs my hand, and we started to evolve in our relationship, dated for, for two and a half, three years before we got engaged, and ended up getting married here in San Diego in Balboa Park, and like I said, we're going on almost 13 years now, three kids later. Thank you, thank you. All applause goes to her, honestly, all of like, like she's easy, I'm the one who's difficult, um, and she's not in here, so I could say that. I can say that. I can. <laughs> She's actually over serving uh, in our kids' ministry, and I would encourage you, if you've got kids, we would ask that you would, you would commit at least one Sunday a month to helping out with those kiddos uh, because we have a lot of families that are represented here, a lot of kids, and my wife has, has do done that. She stepped up, and she's committed one Sunday a month to serving in there. So I want to encourage you to do the same. But we're going on 13 years, and I'm hoping that we go the long run, right? Most of us who get married... During our first marriage, we don't refer to it as a first marriage, right? Nobody, nobody aims to get a divorce. Nobody says, this is my trial run, right? Relationships are going to go one of two ways. You're either going to break up or you're going to stay together. There's no in-between, right? But when it comes to divorce rates, when it comes to marriages and all those things, the odds for us do not look good. Uh, there was a recent study that came out that said by the time somebody is 80 years old, by the time people are 80 years old, 90% of them will have been married. So 90% of people in America will be married by the time they're 80 years old. We have the fourth highest divorce rate uh, in the entire world. That means there's one divorce every 13 seconds here in America. Now think about that for a second with me. That means if the average wedding ceremony is 25 minutes long, that means during that wedding ceremony, there are 115 divorces that take place here in America. The odds don't look good for marriages. There's, there's another stat that said 21% of people within marriages who are willing to admit it, 21% of people in marriages have been unfaithful to their spouse. There's websites out there that are dedicated to married people meeting other married people for relationships and outside affairs. The odds do not look good for marriage. They just don't. That's the culture that we live in today. Now, is it simple luck? Is it a good, good roll of the dice where you dealt the proper hand if your, if your marriage does work out? Absolutely not. I believe that there is something more to it, and I believe that the Bible tells us that there is something more to it. See, marriage, intimacy, and some of those other things God has created, they were his idea. And I think that if we look to his word, about some of this stuff, we can learn what it means to, to build a successful, healthy relationship and a good, healthy marriage. And as I said, today we're talking about singleness and we're talking about healthy biblical attraction. And do not check out married couples. Do not check out, because I'm going to be talking to you too. And this week we're talking about that. Next week we're going to talk about dating. We're going to move on to intimacy and some other things. And we're going to be spending a lot of our time in the, in the book of Song of Solomon. And, and we'll be jumping into some PG-13 type material. So just be aware of that, those of you who bring your, your kids in with you. Um, and I do want to give a big shout out. We got a lot of this material from, uh, from Pastor Matt Chandler and Pastor Greg Rochelle. They do a lot of work in some of these areas. And so a lot of this content has come from them. But when it comes to being single, I got married when I was 23, okay? I don't really know what it's like to be a grown adult and to be single. I just don't. I had no business getting married when I was 23. I had no idea how to be a husband. I had no idea how to do anything. But I committed to this woman, right? I was just really anxious to get married is really all it was. But I don't really know what it's like to be single and to be an adult. And I feel like I feel like sometimes married couples can look upon people who are single 
as like they're lacking something or, or they're less than. And that's completely opposite from what the Bible teaches us. We're going to look at that in just a minute. And, and if you are single in this place, we do talk a lot about marriage. We talk a lot about families. We don't at all want you to feel ostracized. We don't want you to feel singled out. We don't want you to feel any of those things because, again, the reality is, is that singleness is also a biblical concept as well as marriage is. A guy named uh, Ron Belgu, this is what he says. He says, in celibacy, referring to abstaining from sex or being single, he says, in, is celibacy hard? Yes. So is marriage. So is grad school. Life is pain, princess. Is it frustrating? At times, yes. But watch somebody trying to raise a toddler, and you'll see, and that might change your perspective. Married life is difficult, too. Having kids is difficult, too. Just like singleness can be difficult as well. We see three types of singles. If we were to break it down into, into those people who are single, this is what we see. We see uh, the first class is essentially those who are born that way, born single, born with, with a predestination, if you will, God ordained, God, God's will for their life is to be a single person. Now, that is a very small group of us. There's, there's those who are vowed in their singleness, those who just choose to stay single and choose to not get married ever. But then the majority are those who are the dedicated singles, those who are choosing, whether, whether you're, you've, you've been married and you're now divorced and, and whether you've been widowed or whether you're just, you're just waiting for that special someone to come along. That's about 90% of America, about 90% of America falls into that category. Am I crackling a lot? You guys hear that? We're trying to deal with the mic. My apologies. If it gets worse, I'll go ahead and grab that over there. But, but let's look at this. What does the Bible actually say about being single? What does the Bible tell us about singleness? The first thing that the Bible tells us is it says that singleness is a gift, right? Some of the married people are like, glory, hallelujah. I wish I'd have never gotten married. <laughs> Some of you single people are like, there's no way. There's no way that singleness is a gift. This is awful. And there's all the different opinions and perspectives in between. But the Bible does. The Bible says that singleness is a gift and that it should be celebrated. The Apostle Paul, he writes most of, of the New Testament. He was actually single, okay? And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He's writing to the church at Corinth. He says, I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am. Speaking about singleness, he's saying, I wish all of you were as I am. Uh, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that gift. He is referring to his own singleness as a gift. Now, he's not saying that some people have been gifted this idea of contentment, you know? He's not saying that, like, some of us just choose to, to be single, and we're just content with that, and God has removed all of those sexual desires and, and intimacy desires. He's removed all those things from us, and that's the gift. That's not what he is saying at all. What he is saying is he's saying that the season that you are in is a gift, whether that season is marriage or singleness. Now, I'm not saying if you've been widowed, I'm not saying if you've been divorced, that is the gift. What I'm saying is the season that God has you in is a gift, and we'll, we'll touch on that in just a second. This is what the second thing, the second thing the Bible says about being single, is it says, you are spared the troubles of marriage. You are spared. Now, some of you are like, this, this pastor lies. This is not true. This is not in the Bible. All right, we'll see. We'll see. If you are single, you got single people problems, right? Right? If you are married, you got married people problems. All the married men said, hello. No, I'm just kidding. Don't. Don't, don't say that. You still have to ride home with your spouse, so don't, don't do that. But if, you, if you're poor, you got poor people problems. If you're rich, you got rich folk problems. If you're short, you got short people problems. Tall, you got tall people problems. We all have problems. And what we cannot do is we cannot convince ourselves that the season that we think we should be in is better than the season that God has us in. Okay, we've all heard the saying, the grass is greener on the other side of the hill, right? A good friend of mine, he says, the grass is greener on the other side of the hill because it's fertilized with bull crap. Like, we're convincing ourselves that there's something better in a different season. We're convincing ourselves that there's something better for us on the other side. But you are spared the troubles of marriage if 
you are single. This is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you of this. Hello. He goes on in verse 32. So he says, says, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How can he please the Lord? But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world. How, can, uh, how he can please his wife and his interests are divided. It goes on to say the same thing about women. It says, an unmarried woman is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to, uh, to the Lord in both her body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. But she, uh, yeah, how can she please her husband? I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but, uh, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So what is he saying? He's saying that if you are married, your attention is divided. He's saying that your attention is divided. We have anxieties about things as married people that we shouldn't have anxieties about. A $5 foot long cost me like 60 bucks because I got a whole family. <laughs> Someone's got to have cookies and a kid's meal and nobody got the toy that they wanted and my wife wants extra this and that and the otherwise and like someone's crying by the end of it. But if you're single, you've got undivided attention. The Bible tells us your, your attention is undivided for what he has for you. You actually have more time to be able to devote to what God has called you to do than those of us who are married. Now, are there struggles being single? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're not going to negate those things, but there's, there's obviously there's going to be the sexual desire that you have. There's going to be the desire for intimacy and closeness and loneliness. And there's some of those challenge. Some of those challenges do exist for you if you are single. But I would encourage you to allow some of those desires that you have, some of those things that are inside, uh, allow them to remind you of the need for a Savior. Allow them to remind you of the intimacy that you need to find in God. And the loneliness, allow that to encourage you to find a good, healthy community. Now, if you are in the, if you are in the majority of singles and you're here today, Okay? If you're in that 90% who is choosing right now to stay celibate and to be um, not in a relationship, you're waiting for that right person to come along, we want to look briefly at what the Bible says about biblical attraction. Okay? What it is that you should be looking for in a future spouse, what it is that you should be looking for in a future mate, but more importantly, what you yourself should be working on. Okay? We're going to look at it both and here, okay? What you want to look for and who you should work to become. We're going to be spending the rest of our time this morning and the next few weeks in the book of Song of Solomon. I, I mentioned that earlier. And this is an interesting book. It was written about a thousand years before Jesus comes on the scene. And, and it can be looked at as an allegory. It can be looked at, it's, it's a bunch of poems. And it can be looked at an allegory, as an allegory where it's Christ's love for the church or, or God's love for Israel. Or it could be looked at essentially like a poem, and that's the way that we're going to be looking at it today. It's this poem between this, this, this young woman, the Shulamite woman, and, and this young man, and the whole thing just kind of unfolds this romantic relationship and courtship and intimacy and all of these different things. We even see him get into a fight. Um, there's lots of things that happen in this book, and that's where we're going to be spending our time. And as we look at it today, I think there's four things that we can pull from this first section. We're mainly going to be living in chapter 1. But there's a lot that we can see that happens in chapter 1. And I believe there's four things that we see that show us and tell us what biblical attraction looks like and what it should be based on. The first thing that we see is physical attraction. Now, let me be clear about this. I am not saying that you should strive to be physically attractive in the way that culture says you should be physically attractive, okay? What I am saying is that physical attraction needs to be there. Between a single woman, a single man, physical attraction should be there. Now, let's be honest, too. That's very, the, 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 the term even in and of itself, uh, attraction, is very relative, right? It's very relative. Some of us like different things than others. 
You know, it's, it's, it's really based on personal preference, who we are, right? But here's the thing. When it comes to physical attraction, we can't, we can't judge a book by its cover, right? Culture tells us this is what you should look like, right? But really to each his own, right? There's some people I've seen, it's like, man, like you look like you've fallen out of the ugly tree and you've hit every branch on the way down, but you found love. What's the matter with me? Why can't I find love, right? Did I fall out of the same ugly tree just a lot higher up and hit every branch on the way down and the ugly ground? Like, what is the matter with me? Am I broken? Physical attraction should be there. We see it all throughout this book, all throughout this book. But in the very beginning of this book, this is the Shulamite woman speaking, and this is what she says to her man. She's saying, she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Whoa, we went from zero to 100. Clearly, if she's saying that she wants him to kiss her and to embrace her, she doesn't think that he's ugly. <laughs> she doesn't think that his teeth are all crooked and yellow. If, he, if she wants him to kiss her. John Mayer, he's a famous musician. This is what he says. He says, if you're pretty, you're pretty. But the only way to be beautiful is to be lover, loving. Otherwise, it's just congratulations on your face. <laughs> Physical attraction is important. It's important, but it has to quickly, 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 quickly move beyond that into something much deeper. This is what it says in verse 3. This is still the, the, the Shulamite woman talking. She says, your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. So she's saying this to this young man. She's saying, your anointing oils are fragrant. She's saying, your reputation precedes you. Your reputation goes far beyond, and it precedes you. And then when, when she says, therefore, virgins love you, what she's saying is she's saying, when people talk about you, when the, when the other single women talk about you, they don't have any negative things to say about you. They got nothing bad. They love you. Everybody loves you. But the important thing that we want to focus on is right here where it says, your name is oil poured out. Now, what this means is she is talking. She's not referring to just his name. He doesn't have just a good name. She's referring to his character. She is saying, because of your character, virgins have good things to say about you. The other women have other, they have good things to say, but your character is more important because reputation is what we're known for, but character goes far beyond. And character is what really counts. When it comes to biblical attraction, the, the person that we want to strive to be is a person of character. The, the, when it comes to biblical attraction, the type of person that we want to look for is a person of character. We want to look for somebody who has some of these qualities that we need. If we're going to call ourselves godly men, we want to look for a godly woman. If we're going to call ourselves a godly woman, we want to look for a man of godly character. Okay? There is no time to start like today. If you want to be a godly man, start today. Start striving today. If you want to be a godly woman, start striving today. I fully believe that a good marriage isn't just built on who you find, but I think it's built on who we are becoming. And I think that we need to intentionally work toward becoming a person of character. The Bible tells us, says, seek first his kingdom and all these things will be given unto you. We need to put him first. The closer we get to God, I truly believe the closer we are going to get to our future spouse. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, I am a person of good character, but I'm, I'm only attracting awful people. Well, here's what I'll say to you. Like attracts like. Like attracts like. If you don't like the fish you're catching, look at the bait you're using. You might want to change it. Guys, if all you're doing is posting like buff shirtless pictures from like you at the gym all sweaty, if that's all you're posting online and you're getting all these, all these women, what are you using? What's the bait that you're using to catch these women? That's not godly character. That's like, check out my pecs, right? Ladies, if you're just up in the club every night, doing your thing, dancing the way you shouldn't be, probably dressing the way you shouldn't be, and you're attracting these guys who only want one thing, in what way, shape, or form are you baiting them in? And I don't mean to be harsh, but it's the truth. It's the reality. Like attracts like, and if you're married, it doesn't stop. 
Continuing to work on your character is something that should continue, absolutely continue. Let's look at uh, verses 5 and 6 here. This is the young woman writing, and she's saying, I am very dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Qatar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keep, they made me keeper of the vineyard, but not uh, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Now there's a lot in this, and so we're gonna we're gonna spend a second here unpacking this. So what she's saying here is she's saying, I'm not all that pretty. That's what she's saying. Remember, we just talked about how physical attraction is important, but it has to go far beyond that. Somehow he found her physically attractive, even if she didn't find herself physically attractive. She's saying, I'm very dark, like the tents of Qatar. She's saying that she's 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 been burned by this by the sun because she's been working outdoors. Okay? So that means she's probably come from a lower um, a, a lower income class. Okay, her social status was lower than she probably would have preferred. And she compares herself to the daughters of Jerusalem. Now, the daughters of Jerusalem were essentially the, those, those rich ladies. Okay? They, were, they were rich. They, they lived uh, in the urban areas and didn't have to work outdoors. And a lot of them probably didn't even have to work at all. And back when this was written, that fair skin... That was what was looked upon as beauty. And nowadays we have people go and they lay out and they, they pay money to go to, to tanning salons. But when you were tanned from the sun back in the day, when you had that unnatural dark complexion from the sun, that was not considered attractive at all. So we see here, she's saying, she's saying do not gaze at me because I am dark. I'm, I'm ugly. I've been burned by the sun. If she's working outside, her hands are probably beat, right? She probably got nasty hair. And then she says, my mother's sons, so her brothers, my mother's sons were angry with me. Okay, so there's some family drama here. We start to see some depth. She's starting to open up about who she is. And then she says, they made me keep, uh, they made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyards have not been kept. This is referring to herself, her own body. She has not been able to focus on staying pretty and staying beautiful and getting all gussied up all the time because she was required to work we start seeing again that there's depth to her. She starts opening up about her past. She starts opening up to to this young man about who she is, about who she really is. So what we see from her is we see that she's starting to be honest about who she is. And my encouragement to you and the third thing that I think that we see when we look through this is that you want to work to become a person of honesty. And you want to look for a person of honesty and depth and of character. Here's what we're not saying. I am not saying to you, men, once you get that date with that girl that you've been really eyeing for a long time, that you've really liked for a long time, that you've really been pursuing for a long time, I am not saying on your first date that you start airing your dirty laundry and you start talking about how crazy your mother is or the fact that your uncle has the nickname the butcher. Like you don't, you don't want to share anything and everything that you shouldn't, that's called being unwise, okay? We want you to use wisdom, but what we are saying is that as you grow closer to one another, as you get closer in intimacy, you want to be honest about who you are. You don't want to be eight years into marriage and find out that your spouse has $90,000 in student debt. That's something that, that you should talk about beforehand. Again, not the first date, but you want to become open. You want to become an honest person. And, and, and you don't just want to be honest to the other person. You want to be honest with yourself. You want to look inside and you want to see what are the good things about me? What are the bad things about me? What are the ugly things about me? What's the baggage that I bring into this relationship? What are the things about my past that might affect my future relationship with this person? You want to find somebody who's honest about their strengths and their weaknesses and are working on them. And you want to be a person who is honest about your strengths and weaknesses. And I encourage you to work on them. I am a big fan of therapy. I love it. I absolutely love it. Some of you are thinking, this dude's crazy. I love it. I've been going to therapy for a long time, years and years and years. And I will encourage anybody to continue to go because, as I said earlier, I believe that a good marriage is not just built on who you find, but who you as a person are becoming. Figure out what those weaknesses are that you have. Be honest about them and work toward them. 
If you're married in this place, this applies to you. I want to encourage you to continue to be a person of honesty and continue to become a person of honesty about your strengths, about your weaknesses. Husbands, it is time to be honest with your wives and tell them that you don't really get along with your mother-in-law. Wives, it's time to be honest with your husbands and tell them, like, you know that he doesn't get along with your mother-in-law. It's time for us to be honest. It's never too late for us to continue to work on ourselves, to become a better person, to allow the scriptures and the Holy Spirit to shape us in to the people that God has called us to be. Let's look at verse 7. This is what she's saying to him still. This is the Shulamite woman talking. She says, Tell me, you whom my soul loves, mm, so romantic, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flocks, uh, where, you make, where you make it lie down at noon, for why should I be like the one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? Now here's what she's doing. She's comparing herself again. Remember, she compared herself to the beautiful women, the daughters of Jerusalem. We see her do that throughout the entire book. She's, she's comparing herself good and bad. And right now she's comparing herself to the veiled women. Now, what was a veiled woman? A veiled woman was a prostitute. A veiled woman was a prostitute. And she's saying, why should I be like the one who veils herself? Why should I go and hang out and, and be like one of these women, hang out with with?" all these guys who are pasturing their flocks, all, the, all, the, all of them, why should I do like, do like they do? Why should I be like they are? She is saying that she wants to do it differently. She wants to be looked at differently. The fourth and final thing that I think we should really be aiming to be is a person of high standards. I think we should aim to be a person of high standards. I think we should look for somebody that has high standards. Now, this Shulamite woman, she is referring to the the sexual realm. And let's just be honest here. That's an area where our culture today has really dropped its standards. It means almost nothing in 2019 for people to be sexually active before they're married. It's like we see see single people wanting to be like married people but not actually taking that step. We see them living together. We see them having sex. We see them in these relationships. And we see married people almost acting like single people. Oh, i got to get away from the old ball and chain. I need some space. I need me time. We have it so confused. But she's referring to this area of sexuality. And I would encourage you to set a high standard for yourself. We just looked at some of these stats. Marriages do not look like they're going to succeed In 2019, it does not look like they're going to succeed. And you might be saying to yourself, oh, Dan, you're just being prude. It's 2019, man, like loosen up. The truth of the matter is this, you might say to me, hey, everybody's having sex. But the truth of the matter is, if you want what everybody else has, then you'll do what everybody else does. But if you want something different, if you don't want your marriage to end in divorce, if you don't want to, if you want to protect yourself from looking outside of your marriage to be fulfilled, you've got to do things different. If you want what everyone else has, do what everyone else does. But if you don't set a high standard for yourself, especially in the realm of sexuality, and set a high standard for yourself in lots of different areas when it comes to mental, emotional, physical, all of those things that you desire out of somebody else, set a high standard. Now, there is a difference. There is a big difference between setting a high standard for yourself and for somebody else and having an unrealistic expectation, okay? I used to work with someone who talked about like, oh, I want this, I want that. He's gotta be rich. He's gotta be at least 6'4". He's gotta be this, he's gotta be that. He can't have any debt. He can't have this, but he's gotta be a doctor. I'm like, wait a second, wait. You want him like 27 years old, but he's like, got to be a doctor, but he can't have any debt? Like, how does that, how does that even work? Can you be a doctor by the time you're 27? Can you be a doctor without having $400,000 in student debt? I don't know. But some of those standards are impossible. And we can't set that double standard of saying, well, I, I'm bringing in all of this baggage, but this person can't bring in any baggage. I've got all kinds of debt, but he can't have any. I've got all kinds of family issues and stuff from my past, but his should be perfect. We can't set impossible expectations. 
but we should have high standards. And if you want to honor God, you want to honor yourself, you want to honor your future spouse, set high standards, especially in the area of sexuality. And again, married folks, it is never too late. Never too late to start setting higher standards for the way that you treat each other, for the way that you act, for the things that you say when you are mad. Okay, there is never, it's never too late for you to set a higher standard for the way you raise your kids, the way you manage your money, your finances. There is never, um, it's never going to be too late for you to do that. So to wrap this up, I would encourage you to continue to come back the next couple weeks because we're going to be diving into some of these other things, dating and intimacy. But if you are single in this place, know that it is a gift. Know that you are not lacking. If you are married and you encounter somebody who's single, do not look at them like they are lacking something or they are less than. And I would encourage you too, if you are single, to use those desires that you have in your heart to seek after God, to find healthy community. And if you are of the majority and you want to be married one day, I would encourage you to look for a person of high character. Look for a person who's got high standards. Look for a person who's honest. And if you're married, just like dating shouldn't stop, working on yourself and working on your marriage shouldn't stop either. Amen? All right. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. I'm going to go ahead and invite the band back up. But let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we are so thankful, Lord, for the gifts that you give us. Whether those gifts, Lord, are, are a season of singleness, Lord. Whether those gifts are the spouse that we've got, the, the relationship that we have, Lord. God, I just pray that we would just acknowledge that. Acknowledge that season and know that you have gifted us. Lord, for, for some of us in here, we have not taken the step yet to call you the Lord of our lives. And I pray that somebody would make that decision today. And if you are in this place and, and you want to make that decision, just say this prayer in the quietness of your own heart. Say, God, I love you. God, I need you. I admit that I'm a sinner, that I'm nothing without you. And I pray that you would forgive me of those sins and I believe that your son Jesus died on the cross. I pray that you just come into my heart and be the Lord of my life from this day forward. And God, I pray that as we strive, whether we are single or married, we would strive to do it your way. That we would strive to do it your way, God, not our way, not our will, but your will, God, and your way. May we live a life that honors you, God, and may we continue to seek you daily to get closer to you so that way if we're not married yet or if we are single, that we would find intimacy in you and that as we get closer to you, God, that you would bring us closer to our future spouse if that's what you so desire for us. God, marriages are under attack, and I pray right now that you would meet us where we are, heal marriages in this room this morning, God. May we put in the work, Lord, to see our marriages transformed, to see our marriages honor and glorify you, Jesus. We love you and we thank you. In your name I pray, amen.